Well, good evening. Um, we last we heard from registration, we had a little under 200 people who signed up tonight, uh, which is really exciting for us um, because when we decided to uh, host this series, we were we had no idea that there'd be this much interest. <laughs> So welcome to all of you who are on right now. And, and uh, um, we appreciate, especially those of you who got on early, uh, we appreciate you being here. We're just really surprised by how uh, well received um, this has been. Um, so a um, couple of housekeeping things. One is I wanted to remind everybody that we are in fact recording this. I'll mention where we're gonna post the recordings, but any, but uh, for those of you who are coming on to this, you're probably all familiar with how this works, but I'll mention it anyway. You're in a webinar suit, um, format, so we cannot see you. Um, so hopefully everybody's okay. Um, we will, all comments and questions will be via chat. Um, uh, so um hopefully folks are fine with the recording um just a little about the series as i said we just this is the first time we've offered this series and it's being it's a collaboration between the arizona state historical preservation office the arizona uh, preservation foundation and the historical archaeological advisory committee and for those who are not familiar with this group we call ourselves hack yeah great great term uh, we are, as I said, we are an advisory body of historians and archaeologists, or historical archaeologists that work with the Arizona State Historical Preservation Office on issues related to the treatment of historical sites in Arizona. Um, the series that we've offered up, and this is the first presentation of the series, this is actually a culmination of, of, of uh, several workshops that we have uh, presented over the years as part of the of Arizona's annual preservation conferences. And this year we thought since we already had the pres presentations and the people to actually do the presentations that we would try offering it as a, um, oh, sorry, if I, thank you, uh, Terry. Uh, we will try offering it as an online session. Um, so, with that in mind, we did uh, we did uh, design these sessions to be one hour because we had no idea we'd have this many people on. So I apologize if this is not um, going to be enough time, but uh, we will try to get as many questions as we can, and we will definitely um, leave, leave some time for questions. Um, I also want to mention that on if you did not already see those on the website where we uh, where you registered, we posted two documents there as background information. One is kind of general information about historical archaeology and talks about a couple of products that our our group hack has actually produced. And then the other one is uh, a, a, uh, some good references. And all of these references are related to all the presentations that are going to be in this series. So there's some great information in those two documents. They're posted there. Feel free to get in and download them. Uh, I specifically want to highlight uh, the first document, that the, uh, the background in historical archaeology, that um, has a link to uh, what is a, a document known as Down in the Dumps. This, is, in fact, is an excellent guide. Uh, actually, was developed in Arizona. I, I don't know. Terry was about ten years ago, and um, we just—it was just updated. So, what you will see is an updated. I think updated as of about a year ago, um, and it's a guide on how to address and record um, municipal dumps and large dumps. So it's. Um, there are also other products that the hack has produced over the years that are posted on the Arizona um, SHPO or State Historic Preservation Office website. Um, and there, plus there's also some great context studies there that I strongly recommend that folks um, take a look at. And, um, and I think there's probably some, some very, very valuable um, information there. So general logistics. Um, the as I said, we're going to do the uh, tonight. We're going to do the presentation. I'm going to introduce Terry here for just a moment. She will do a presentation, and we will absolutely um, allow her some time for some questions, follow up questions. 
please put your questions in the chat. I'm going to um, try to keep up with those chat questions and feed them to Terry so she can answer them. Tom Jones, who is also a member of Hack, we're having issues getting him in. Um, I may feel to have him field a couple questions too, um, and he may have to do so via the chat. Um, then we'll we'll uh, reminder of the next series, and we'll do a follow up, uh, a few other announcements before we finalize the entire presentation. Um, this is the first one of the series, first time we've done this, so some feedback would be definitely be great from folks. Um, and please bear with us if we are still figuring out the technical issues, because as I said, this is this is all very new to us. So with no further ado, I uh, would like to introduce our presenter, Terry Matuski, or I should say Dr. Terry Matuski. Um, and I'm hopefully you all read her bio on, on the poster. So I'm gonna shorten it just a little bit by saying that she is the executive vice president at Statistical Research Incorporated or SRI for those who are familiar with it. Um, she serves as the senior principal investigator and senior project manager on large heritage management contracts. And because of her extensive experience with carrying out prod, uh, projects subject to federal, state, and local preservation laws and regulations, she works closely with clients, uh, particularly the federal government, to ensure program, program development and implementation. Specifically to this presentation, uh, she has been, uh, let's see, she, um, prior joining SRI, she managed to be editor of the Society for American Archaeology Journal, American Antiquity and Let, uh, Latin American Antiquity. She's written lectures extensively about historic, historical ceramics and is particularly interested in the development of European and American ceramic technology and trade from the late 18th century uh, 1950. So, Dr. Majewski, I will let you take it away from there. Thank you, Margaret, and good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining people from all over the country, and I know this is late for some of you. So, I just want to warn you before I bring up my presentation that it's usually something that I do in several hours, um, and what we'll miss is the hands-on portion, but I'll uh, I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of uh, the way that I look at the analysis and understanding of historical ceramics, primarily um, European and American, specifically within Europe, the United Kingdom, um, because they had ceramics uh, found every corner of the earth just about. It's amazing where English ceramics are found. Um, so anyway, I will bring up my PowerPoint, and then we'll get going. Is that showing? Yes. Great, so I'm gonna go ahead and start the slideshow. Okay, is that sidebar obscuring the, the projection of the, of the slideshow or no? I don't see that. Is anyone? Can everyone see it? I'm assuming. I, it's all I, good. Yeah, I'm going to move it over. So, okay. So this this presentation was originally developed for folks working in the West, and uh, so really the focus is on post Civil War to the mid 20th century, because with sort of the the 50 year rule for evaluating National Register significance, um, 50 years is a it's a good number and it's also a moving number. So uh, there are things that we, we really need to work on post 1950, but that's, I think that's really sort of in progress. So that's why the focus is the way it is, but I um, actually do uh, give a little bit of background and um, I've worked on ceramics. Uh, I haven't always lived in the West, uh, worked on ceramics that go back to the late 1600s. So they're of special interest to me. So one of the things that I have come to learn over the years is that to understand and to work with historical ceramics, you need several things. And uh, it's a multi-pronged approach. And it's specific, it's very important for doing the things that we need to do best with ceramics, which are dating and understanding social structure and different things like that. 
Um, so first you need an understanding of the technology of ceramic production. And many people do understand and have studied prehistoric ceramic production very different than historical ceramic production, which is, uh, was on its way to being industrial in the 1700s. Um, also, I feel that an understanding of style as manifested in ceramic vestal shape and decoration is important. This is important for us uh, in terms of other classes of material culture as well. So something to keep in mind. Also, you need access to a reference library and comparative collection published and web-based. And we're lucky that many things are web-based now. And we need a common vocabulary for communicating about ceramics. And part of the problem is archeologists tend to invent names for things that really aren't the names that the ceramic producers call them. And I think we tend to do that because we can't ask the prehistoric people what they call something. So, so we tend to invent names and argue about them and have long discussions about them. Um, but I've found that using ceramic terminology as used by producers, uh, people that understood the technology and so forth is very useful. And also the, the terms that they use to market them. So some basic concepts, body is what prehistorians refer to as paste, and it's roughly equivalent to wear as understood by historical archeologists. And the body is also defined as the clay part of a pot as opposed to any additional parts that we talk about like slips, glazes, or colors. Most of us know that a glaze is a coating fused to a ceramic body, either to seal it against moisture, as in the case of porous earthenwares, or to decorate it. And a glaze can look very glassy on earthenwares, and that's generally because lead-based glazes were used until about 1950, which was a huge problem in the ceramic industry, but it made for beautiful ceramics. The designs uh, underneath the glaze were just brilliant and held up, and that's why people loved it. Um, and it can also look very glassy on porcelain, but on uh, majolica, which is tin glazed earthenware, it is opaque. And those, you know, people on the East Coast will see Dutch and English uh, tin glazed earthenwares. In the West, you tend to see you know, Mexican and Spanish tin glazed earthenware, which is actually quite different than some of the Dutch and English products and French. Um, then a slip is potter's clay mixed with water to form a smooth creamy liquid used to decorate ceramics and also to make them porous or non-porous um, and make them more hygienic, for example, in, in stonewares. And then colors used to decorate are made from metallic oxides. And I'll, if I don't remember to mention it, um, cobalt oxide has been used for decoration for many, many years, starting with the Chinese, uh, because it can withstand high temperatures and doesn't um, basically disintegrate. And so you see underglazed blue porcelain, which is very early because of their understanding of this metallic oxide. Also, when we refer to, uh, when we talk about overglazed colors, those are enamels and underglazed colors are referred to as paints. So unfortunately I'm seeing this bar at the top. Um, so earthenware, stoneware and porcelain are the most common ceramic bodies that we'll see archeologically. And what I base my understanding and analysis of ceramics on is this most basic point of differentiation in ceramic classification. Uh, and it's determined by the clays and the temperature at which um, a ceramic object must be fired to produce a durable wear. And a critical concept to this notion is vitrification. And that's the process by which clays harden, tighten, and finally become glassified as firing temperatures increase. And so the classification of historical ceramics is complicated by the fact that these terms, earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain, were often used indiscriminately by producers and marketers of historical ceramics um, to make you think you were getting something that you weren't, and they could thus charge more money for it. Um, but in the 1930s, 
American ceramic engineers finally agreed on a classification system for white bodied wares that was based on degree of vitrification, hardness, and translucency. So, so the big push from the 1600s on was to find a white bodied ware that could serve as a vehicle for decoration and be something pleasing on the table. And uh, so we're talking about uh, wares that people used for tableware, um, all different classes of that, as well as for uh, food storage and uh, things like that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so this, this system was based on degree of vitrification, basically how high fired it was, how hard it was, and how translucent it was. So this, this concept of vitrification is a much more subjective and, and accurate way, less subjective and more accurate way of subdividing historical ceramics into wares. And so earthenware and porcelain are on opposite ends. So earthenwares tend to be very uh, porous and porcelains are not, they're very, they're very non-porous. So as I said, earthenwares, we're mostly familiar with these because they're the least expensive wares. We're familiar with them uh, in prehistoric ceramics because the firing technology was such, it was limited by how, how hot a fire could be produced with the materials at hand. So most earthenwares are non-vitreous. They're fairly porous, including redwares, colonial ware, tin glazed earthenware, and white bodied earthenware. So, You've read in the archaeological literature uh, about creamware, pearlware, and whiteware. These are simply white bodied earthenwares. And creamware was the first to get it lighter than it had been before. The paste was light, the beautiful lead glaze over it made it a great vehicle for decoration or even undecorated. It was, it was very popular and in demand. Uh, pearlware was, they added a little bit of cobalt oxide to the glaze to whiten that creamy look, especially when they were trying to imitate uh, oriental porcelain wares, but in earthenware. And then whiteware is such a common uh, body uh, when they perfected how to keep the body and the glaze together and make it very white. Uh, whitewares go from right around 1800 to the present day, really. And uh, some earthenwares are semi-vitreous. Those are moderately porous. And these include ironstone, which is really a misnomer, but unfortunately often used by archaeologists. And it's more appropriately termed white granite, which is what the producers called it. And other earthenwares are vitreous. They're barely porous or non-porous. And this includes hotelware. And I have a few examples of that. It is very hard, very thick. And besides earthenwares, we have stoneware and porcelain, and they're vitreous. Um, different kinds of porcelain, I'll, if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so the harder a ceramic body, the higher temperature at which it was fired, and the sharper a broken surface will appear. Some of you who have seen broken porcelains um, or even some really high-fired stonewares uh, are surprised at how sharp um, the breaks are even after many years of being in the ground in the archaeological record. So, and then the softer ceramic body, the more subject the surface will be, uh, sorry about that typo, will be subject to crazing, cracking, and discoloration. And um, often it's because the glaze and body have a misfit before they're fired. And um, it allows for cracking, dirt to get in, you know, other things if it's in, um, you know, a, a heavily uh, iron rich soil, they'll, they'll be very stained or if they're in privies, they'll be stained and so forth. Um, so just briefly, some terms for forms and parts of vessels. <coughs> I borrowed this from a very useful book. Um, it's, it's difficult when we're doing ceramic analysis, unless you're extremely familiar with whole vessels to know what to call them. And I always tell my students, the people didn't eat off of sherds. So I have an extensive teaching collection that I think has been very beneficial for students to handle things and get an idea of 
of these different things uh, that we're talking about. So um, I don't know if you've done ceramic analysis and you've, um, you know, the basics are pretty simple, you know, cups, bowls, plates, but then often some of these sets were extensive of, of ceramics uh, and we don't even see these kinds of things on our tables today, such as soup plates. Um, you know, others are very, are more intuitive. Uh, when talking about a plate or platter, uh, if you get into an analysis where you're describing decoration on a surface, um, you might want to use some of these terms. We all know what a rim is or a lip, uh, but other really key things are the base and the foot ring, because the foot ring will tell us a lot about what type of wear it is, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so parts of a cup or bowl, let's say um, here we show at the, on the bottom shot, a brink or carination at the break there, but we might call that a composite form. I mean, they, these things make sense, but they actually have very distinctive, they're very time sensitive, some of these shapes. So, um, you know, as you get more into this, you, you start becoming familiar with that. So now I'll just give you an overview of some common earthenwares that, and maybe not so common earthenwares that, you've, that you may have seen. Uh, so here's an example of an 18th century English tin glazed earthenware, and it's a non-vitreous body, so it was, it's very porous. Uh, you can see the opaque milky glaze over the surface. Now, actually, most tin glazed earthenwares, it didn't matter what color the body was. So often these, these wares are kind of a tan or salmon color because they're co covered with this heavy opaque glaze, that then can be decorated. And often these plates were made because English por or Chinese porcelain was coming in from the Orient in the China trade uh, at this time. And uh, not everybody could afford that. So this was a good um, substitute. And also sometimes sets that had been ordered from China, uh, shipped to England, things were broken over time very skillful decorators made replacement plates, which is kind of a fascinating thing. Um, so other non-vitreous uh, white-bodied earthenwares are some of these early ones that we talk about, creamware and pearlware. Uh, you can see the distinct beige tint to the creamware. It's enameled over glaze because you could never get those colors. Uh, there were no high temperature resistant colors at that time in the 1760s. For, uh, except for cobalt. Uh, so pearlware uh, was an, again an attempt to make a wider body, also to imitate oriental porcelains. And, and so these forms are interesting because they're made in the shape of Chinese tea bowls, which are very small. And sometimes we mistake them or misattribute them uh, as children's uh, tea sets, and they're not. They're just because tea was so expensive. I mean, these are not much bigger than your fist if you have a large fist. <laughs> well, maybe smaller than a large fist, but um, you can see the distinctive foot ring. In creamware, uh, a distinctive way of telling it apart, usually sort of the green and the glaze uh, pools in the foot ring. Uh, and on pearlware, it's, it's the blue in the glaze, the pools in the foot ring. So here's some non-vitreous white-bodied earthenwares later in time, often referred to as pearl as whiteware. So basically very white, um, often decorated over the glaze with enamels or under glaze with paints. Um, not so much in the West, but very much in the Midwest and in, in, in the East, you get um, shell edge wares that have a very dis distinctive trajectory from early on in the late 1700s up until almost 1900, uh, where you get a more, um, a more distinctive, uh, well-molded rim to uh, a much uh, less distinctive rim. And the bottom shirt in the, on the right is actually uh, shell edge, but it's been burned. Semi-vitreous white-bodied earthenwares that um, you see very, very frequently in the Midwest and farther east. Um, iron, what archaeologists often refer to as ironstones, uh, more appropriately white granite, began about the 1840s. And one theory about why these were uh, 
why these became so popular was because they were made in imitation of French porcelain, which was very high status at that time, stark white, often with gold uh, trim around uh, the edges and things like that. But the distinctive thing about white granite, um, especially the early forms, beautiful molded wares that as we'll see were registered. Uh, the designs were often registered. Um, and I definitely consider molding and patterning like this as a form of decoration. Uh, another reason it was so popular, it was much more able to make the trip across country to the west, up the rivers and steamboats, around, um, you know, around the different tips of continents <laughs> um, in sailing ships to get to their destinations. Often things are offloaded and then taken somewhere in carts. So you see a lot of, in the West, you see a lot of handleless cups and that's not something you necessarily see in England. What's fascinating is that this was a huge production by English, uh, British ceramic producers, uh, but there's almost none of it to be found <clears throat> over there in their museums. And so, um, I have a friend in a museum there. We've had to repatriate numerous pieces back to them so that they can show them. I mean, it, it accounted for the ceramic production, thousands and thousands of pieces and probably hundreds of factories did it. So this, this mark is very common. Uh, Meekin and Sons on this, uh, on the right-hand image. Um, it's still not fully vitreous though because you can see the crazing and the, and the discoloration in the glaze. A very important wear though for people um, working most anywhere in the US. Um, so vitreous white bodied earthenwares, um, again, this is what uh, we would often refer to as hotel wear. They made it for ships, hotels, uh, cafes. I remember um, going to graduate school in the Midwest and you could still go to a diner and get a cup like on the right. Um, but you could hurt someone with this, it's very heavy. The one on the right is, is a piece, it's a bowl from Manzanar, um, historic site in California, um, but it's uh, U.S. Quartermaster. Uh, there, at that, at this point, this would be later because it's marked. You can see it was made on March seventeenth, nineteen forty-two, possibly. But these things were made uh, under contract for the military because they would withstand the rigors of multiple washings and use by unruly soldiers, possibly. Um, so here's some more vitreous white-bodied earthenware. Uh, made for a, you know, a hotel or a store. This is a little bit thinner than the previous shirt I showed you, but um, the right hand, the base of this uh, piece, it's a small dish um, made by an English factory and trying on is the pattern, but Parmalee, and I can't read the other, but it's, it's a company in Los Angeles that sold these pieces that they were, they probably ordered them with their, with their name on the back and then they were sold in their store possibly for hotels throughout the West. And so um, I, I just wanna mention that, that hotel wares became, when the, Aram, the American ceramic industry started taking off in, mm, before the Civil War, on the East Coast, basically Midwest and, and East, uh, a lot of expat Brits came over and worked in these factories, started some of the most famous ones like, or, or had, had employees like places like Homer Laughlin and so on. Um, the American producers gave the English a run for their money in terms of hotel wear. So stonewares are very important. We won't have much time to touch on them here, but um, an early attempt in the late 1600s and uh, to late in the 1700s was to use stoneware clays, like very white ones or well, white-ish, because this, this piece on the left is gray, um, to make tableware forms. And these were pressed in molds. They were very heavy. Um, they, they were sort of limited. When you tried to decorate these, people were not so happy with them. So really the whole tableware forms of stone, salt and glaze stoneware were 
not as popular, but the others lived on for decades and decades. So the example on the right is a small um, is a small individual inkwell that might fit into a school desk or you know on some scribe's desk or whatever. But these um, you can see the pebbly sort of pitted surface on the right hand example, and uh, this. This stoneware, this, this glazed brown stoneware was used for uh, larger ink bottles. It was used for beer bottles. It was used for many, many things um, from the mid 1800s onto the early 20th century. And these were basically utilitarian. Um, often we see large mixing bowls um, in the archeological record and a very common, the one on the left, <clears throat> The glaze on the bottom piece of the shirt is Albany slip glaze. It's just a blue, it's a brown uh, iron rich slip glaze. And the, the glaze on the rim is called a Bristol glaze that was supposedly a sanitary glaze that would seal um, and make things, give them a nice light colored white surface. The unglazed portion, you probably wouldn't have to glaze much of this because stoneware is fired at such a high temperature that it doesn't absorb a lot of liquid in it. But some of these were used for things like pickling cracks with a lot of vinegar, salt, or even things that would that might you know, taint and, and get into the body of the wear. Um, the right-hand example is uh, probably a cylindrical, cylindrical vessel, large. Uh, you can see the blue um, cobalt-based decoration, which is very distinctive. In porcelain and bone china, important. We often think that you don't see much of this in the archaeological record, but much of it, it goes un incorrectly attributed, shall we say. Um, and so the English are known for bone china. I'll get into that in just a minute. But most oriental por porcelain is it's it's a very high silicate composition. So when it breaks, it's almost like very sharp breaks and kind of a sugary feel to the paste. Um, so the, the example on the upper left is from uh, it's Chinese export porcelain from a service that George Washington had. And very interesting because a lot of these porcelain shapes, then the same shapes, this, this is an English shape made in China because they were sending over examples of what they wanted it to look like. So they probably sent over a creamware vessel, a creamware um, uh, vessel like cylindrical um, mug like this and had it made with these twisted handles. That's not a Chinese form. Uh, on the right hand side are some examples from Manzanar, which could be Korean, Japanese, or whatever, but you can see the distinctive foot ring. Um, and some of them are made in Japan and were either brought by the residents people who were inter interned in at Manzanar or actually sold to them as some sort of black market thing because they were supposed to be eating off of American-made hotelware. Uh, the bottom left is a fascinating thing. It's, uh, it's called Kagaware. It's Japanese-made, and it's, it's called in the collector literature Geisha Girlware, and we find it very frequently in, in archaeological, well, we often find it, but not in huge quantities. And it's difficult to discern what it is, but it's like an eggshell porcelain. And it's so translucent when you hold it up to the light. And it was very popular um, before the war and after the war and uh, World War II, I'm referring to. And, um, and people, people collected it. It wasn't just made in very intricate, you know, Tea, tea pots and coffee pots and things like that, chocolate pots. Other examples of porcelain, the ones on the top are, are French porcelains, very stark white with that minimalist decoration. These are from the 1840s to 60s because of this, you can see this paneled shape that was very popular during that sort of Gothic revival period of the 1840s to 60s. Um, uh, and actually the ones in the upper left are from the Arabia steamboat that sunk in 1858, if I'm not wrong. Um, the bottom left is an example of probably a German hard paste porcelain that was glazed and used as uh, 
the head and the shoulders of a lady doll. Many of us have seen those with, and then the kid body of the doll was sewn onto that, often with uh, porcelain arms and legs that were um, jointed at the top to be sewn onto the body. And so these are continental examples. Uh, bone china, it's frequently mistaken for porcelain, but it's different. It's a, the same firing regime as, as earthenware. And it's the English perfected this um, by adding ground ox bone to the body. And it's the most translucent thing you've ever seen. And people just were, it was in great demand for tea sets and dessert sets. Um, uh, decorated over the glaze with enamels. Um, one thing about hard paste porcelain, like oriental and continental porcelain, um, the foot rings are never glazed because that's because you can't stack things because of the high firing temperature and they, they just get burned together. But bone china has the same firing regime so it has a glazed foot ring. So you would never find a piece of earthenware that was translucent, even though it has the same firing regime. But if you held one of these up, so maybe one of your grandmothers had English bone china. Um, and so uh, very popular, very often saved and put in people's china cabinets for inheritance. But they also made lower, lower end bone china. So this piece is clunky. They're off the one I'm showing you now, but and they're often um, they're they were often warped in the kiln, but but saved and sold anyway. And again, where it's decorated uh, over the glaze with enameling. The chunk out of this is um, I did some scanning electron microscopy studies, and this is a piece in my collection that I bought for I think an English pound about 30 years ago. And I thought I could sacrifice it. And it was interesting to find out the range in chemical composite, or basically clay composition of these items. Um, so another really key thing is decoration um, and descriptions of overglaze and underglaze decorative treatments help analysts obtain most of the temporal and cultural information used in historical ceramic analysis. So your first step is really just identifying that body, but to really get beyond that and not have just a very broad uh, generalization for the time period, you need this. So major body types are linked with specific decorative methods. And I'm gonna to try to speed up here a little bit because I'm needing to move on. So as I've tried to intimate, firing temperatures and glaze properties serve as limiting factors when considering decorative methods that can be used on a ceramic body. So if you understand decoration, it can give you clues that you need to begin gaining experience. So my two major approaches to studying decoration are style and technology. So I'm just gonna run through these very quickly after I mention these things. Um, we can date ceramics by closely understanding the technology behind the kinds of decoration. And I've added a consideration of style because it's a very time sensitive marker. So some decorative possibilities from a technological perspective. So, so we've got enameling on, on earthenwares um, when it's not possible to do things under the glaze. So on the far right, we have a creamware tea canister that is enameled over the glaze. And you can see how sometimes the glaze starts, or the paint starts flaking off and it, it tends to be, if it's in the ground for a long time, you tend to, it becomes fugitive. Um, actually on the left, you've got um, a spatter uh, where little jug that was on the Arabia steamboat. And um, here's an example of mocha or annular banded wear with, um, with molding along the edge that was done on a turned wheel. And this was a, a slip cup that, um, that dripped this on the surface and then it oozed out over the glaze and made these amazing like decorations that looked dendritic. Um, here's some painting on earthenware. So again, under the glaze, 
often we get this tea leaf ironstone that's called by collectors on the right. Um, very simple. So the simpler the decoration, the less it costs to produce it and the less it was sold for. Uh, very common in the Midwest and elsewhere, uh, these floral patterns on that were, that were easily paintable by children even because children were employed in the ceramic industry. Um, on bone china and earthenware, you tend to often get a little bit more intricate decoration because you could be sold more because it was bone china. So you have a really nice Wedgwood example on the right of a hand painted border. Uh, according, that was a specific pattern in the Wedgwood pattern books. And then the one on the left, the, the, the tea bowl and saucer that's actually a handleless tea bowl, um, just with some cheerful colors uh, painted, enameled over the glaze. Uh, so here's a more intricate example of enameling on bone china. Lots of things and gilding added to the cloths and um, you know this this took a little bit more skill than having the children do it. Uh, a later addition to decoration, there was always this trajectory of getting to intricate decoration for the lowest cost. So so this was starting around the turn of the century when it became very popular to have these what they call a colored ground in the background. Uh, like the sort of brownish, burgundyish color with, with a transfer print uh, in the center because transfer prints could reproduce multiple colors, whereas a transfer print, each color had to, if you had multiple colors, they'd have to be separately applied, which was a pain, so that was rarely done. Um, decals are very important because we see them a lot on ceramics we find from circa 1900 onward. Um, so transfer printing uh, started in the late 1700s, was really perfected in the 1800s and has been popular with the 19th century was its heyday, but there's still patterns such as the, uh, the willow pattern in the bottom, the bottom picture that is popular still today. So in, in uh, there's an article uh, by Patricia Sanford about style and transfer prints on the bibliography on the website that I would really recommend that you look at. Um, also the Transfer Work Collector Club that I'll mention at the end. Um, so I'm gonna to try to wrap this up pretty quickly. Um, we're all familiar with Flow Blue, which was popular in the 1830s as well as the 1880s. So you get these different styles. Um, so here's here decals again. Uh, decals were first produced in France and Germany. And again, um, the one on the left is one from what, about 1907. You can see this calendar plate. Uh, often transfers were like women for calendars or simple floral sort of things that you could dab onto the plate. And, and if, you, if, you're ever, if you've ever seen ceramic or decals on wooden kids furniture. It was really popular like after World War II through about the 1950s. It's the same kind of thing or these slip, these slip tattoos that kids like today. That's sort of the idea of you slip it on the glazed surface. So you're, you're doing it at the very end. Um, and even though the decals cost money, if you don't put too many on, it's still not too expensive of a piece. Um, here's some examples on the right uh, where you, hold on just a second, where you have a sheet transfer on the bottom where a lot of these decorative plates that you see by collectors um, of you know, different things in magazines, those are sheet transfers, sheet decals that are, and then you have Queen Victoria on the top. So uh, let's see, decals continued. You've got, these are examples on the upper left from 1910. You can see the sort of not very many decals around and they're simple. Uh, they're not too detailed. Hugely popular in the Midwest are these, uh, the bluebird decals. Um, the piece on the right is a little bit more intricate because it has molding and decal flowers in the middle. Um, this is, and then around the edge, and this is from a, the, probably the 1920s, the piece on the right. Um, here's a nice de uh, detail. The thing a lot of, uh, the thing that people, they have trouble with, decals versus transfers, but you can see sort of the detail on this, this decal where if you were actually touching this plate, you might feel a raised edge. And you can see where the, the transfer or the decal is worn off 
on the on sort of the edge of the rim as it gets to the center of the plate. And that's something really typical that you would see um, in, in a ceramic decal piece that was underground for a long time or subject to the weather. So these things become fugitive and you can still see the outline of them. And that would not happen with a transfer print. And this piece is from about probably 1930, as late as the 30s. Uh, again, relief molding we've seen with uh, the white granite examples I showed you earlier. Slip glazing, very popular in the 1930s uh, on art pottery as well as on everyday pottery. And the bottom right is Bauer Ringware, which was a factory in California that uh, took up the slip glaze craze that Fiesta Ware had started. And Fiesta was made by, originally made by Homer Laughlin, actually still is. I'm not sure where it's made, but it still has the Homer Laughlin name. But a lot of these, these vibrant colors were uh, made with radioactive metallic things. And uh, they had to stop that and invent new colors. Um, so style is a temporal clue. Um, one point I want you to take away here is that traditional and popular styles coexisted. And they're time transgressive because they might start in one area long before in another area and they cycle um, and repeat through time. Just like fashion, the famous was an Alfred Krober article about fashion and the lengths of hems, how it cycles through time. Um, but the importance about traditional and popular, you can, if you're excavating a large assemblage and you, you, you see certain households with uh, very traditional everyday designs versus those that have the high style popular. There's a lot you can say about things. Um, so actually, I think, unfortunately, I'm going to have to zip through this real quickly. Uh, Rococo style was very early, um, irregular edges, very fascination with um, natural subjects, such as plants, shells, and things like that. It was, it was also adopted in silver and, uh, and furniture and things like that. Neoclassical was a return to this more uh, classical shape, very simple. Um, this is a beautiful pearl or creamware piece. Um, Gothic revival from the 1820s to 60s. I alluded to some of these examples before with these paneled shapes, uh, also composite cups. On the right, you have a saucer that's paneled, as well as the body itself of this handleless cup. Aesthetic movement is uh, very interesting because you have a revival in transfer printing. It was really big up until about the Civil War, and then it picked up again in the 1870s to 90s, and with because of the opening of Japan and, and sort of the asymmetrical and fanciful motifs because an English potter um, normally would probably have an aneurysm with this kind of asymmetry because they're very regularized. And um, so you, you see how that changes from something like Rococo, which is a little bit more um, wild in its decoration to something like this. Interesting how they adopted um, Japanese motifs to English scenery too. Um, but this piece on the right looks very modern. It was actually from the, 18, it is from the 1880s. Um, so those were high style things, things like aesthetic movement. These are things from the same time period that we would call traditional, uh, just traditional floral. On the right, we have a continuation of transfer printing, but you're, you've got floral with slight emphasis from aesthetic movement because they're asymmetrical. But these, these plates on the right are very common in the archeological record and very distinctive because um, if you look on the right, you can see the, the double ring on, the, uh, well, around the very center of the base and then out further. This was an innovation of actual potting that, um, it was a wheel that turned and finished the base. And so this is very distinctive for this 1880s to 1900 period. Again, here's a mark that tricks you, porcelain de terre. It's, you know, what it means is porcelain of the earth, earthenware, they're trying to trick you um, to think that it's porcelain and it's not. <laughs> so Art Nouveau came after um, the aesthetic movement from 1890s 
1910, very sinuous, a lot of matte colors, uh, floral designs. Um, if you see these are very, in art pottery, very, um, very distinctive as well. Um, we have a revival of chinoiserie or Chinese type decoration oriental in the late 19th century, but often paired with this, this really vivid um, metallic aspect of the decoration. Art Deco came next as a popular style. Very, very different kinds of things, uh, mimicking some of those in furniture or, or even architecture. Br bright, vivid colors or black, which was not typically used on ceramics. But I think if you saw these, you would, you would definitely know that they were something different than what uh, traditional popular floral styles. And then here's traditional styles from the same period with using decal technology. Again, the bluebirds and the, the moss rose on the right, a little household scene on the left, um, but again, very distinctive. Um, the late 1930s and traditional from the same period. So we have modernism, modern, uh, very unusual shapes uh, by a famous uh, ceramic um, designer in England. Uh, at the same time, you had this plate by Homer Laughlin that was traditional floral decals. Um, so briefly, I wanna to talk to you about um, dating ceramics from Marx and some of the key tools. Again, there are many more references in the, uh, the bibliography that was mentioned, but two key ones that you should have in your library if you're going to work on ceramics at all are Jeffrey Godden's Encyclopedia of British Pottery and Porcelain Marks. Um, he was actually a ceramic dealer, but he grew up with a love of ceramics since he was a boy. And he made it his business to document primarily British ceramic marks um, to the extent that no one ever had. And he's no longer with us, but this book has been republished numerous times. And it's actually pretty inexpensive to look on Amazon and get a used copy. Um, he did update it, but it's not a very good history of uh, the date. So it'll say 1964, but he actually may have updated it. Um, Kowalski and Kowalski from 1999 is a, is a huge volume, but it expands and it has, it has American and European marks, which is very helpful. He they relied heavily on Godin, but they have some very interesting information. So that, that's also something that would be a good reference work for you if you're going to be dealing with ceramics. Um, some key tools that are online are um, one that we've used before in our company, this marks for ceramics, and it is, um, it is for a fee, but, but there are also other sites associated with this for silver and other things that archaeologists don't find but might be useful to you. But I highly recommend the Transferware Collectors Club. Uh, they have been over the years building a database of transferware and marks and it's free to members and limited access for non-members. But if you just Google Transferware Collectors Club, amazing uh, research. A lot of archaeologists have joined um, so it'll help you with, with patterns of, of, let's say, transfer wares um, and marks. So briefly, I just want to show you a couple. Um, this is a plate from probably the 1820s, 1830s, but Millennium is a pattern name. So if you imagine the flip side of the plate, it would have been a blue transfer ware pattern called Millennium. Um, and the unique thing about this, so it doesn't tell you who the manufacturer is, except for the slip of paper here that somebody studied and figured it out. But the key thing here is the Hill and Henderson importers mark for New Orleans. It's a huge thing. These importers marks have been fascinated with them for years to help you understand trade and distribution of these ceramics. So Hill and Henderson placed an order with Stevenson and Sons for Millennium, and it was stamped with their logo basically with their mark. Um, sometimes older ports um, are very, very useful. And unfortunately they, this is like pre high tech photography or scanning of marks and things like that. And so um, just, just some marks that you might be familiar with from the West. 
And many of these firms um, sold very little of their, of their product in Europe or in Britain. It was essentially made for export. So these are very, very, very common. Um, just some more marks. We've started seeing some here of Trenton, China, New Jersey. That was a big, that was an early ceramic um, hotbed in the US. Um, very common marks that you might see in the West and elsewhere, especially in the Midwest, Meekin, uh, Maddox and Son, um, and, and so on. And you, you know, a very common mark like with Meekin is the, um, the Griffin and the Lion, which are in the Royal Seal. Um, and often Royal was incorporated into the name. So that says Royal Ironstone China. Um, let's see some of these others. Oh, I could do a whole lecture on ceramics. Um, a very useful tool for dating is that they started marking ceramics um, from 1839 to 1884. They used this diamond shaped mark and from they put numbers on the back from 1884 to 1996. So you can, if you, the Godden book in Kowalski and Kowalski and probably online, you can find how to read and decipher these marks. And it will tell you basically the day it was, the day it was registered. And so what they were registering in this early period was often the shape. So those, um, those white granite, white molded wares had intricate patterns that were registered shapes. And so that gives you a five-year window because I think that's how long the registration lasts in three to five years um, of when your piece was made. And then, um, you know, like I said, after 1884, you start, um, you start getting numbers. Um, let's see. So here's an example with another importer's mark, um, but made, we can learn that it was made by Mayor and Elliot and they registered the pattern on the reverse of the vessel called Berlin Swirl. And you can see, um, if you go back to the records, it will tell you um, that it was produced by this mayor and Elliot firm in Longport, England. Um, and the registry mark was, it's 1856. So that's really helpful to know. Um, here's another printed, this is a real interesting one and I wish I had more time to talk about it, but it has two registry marks. So this is the mark that came on, started being used in 1884. But if you look this one up, it, it's for 1892. And that's for the transfer print, which is shown up in the upper left or the shape, right? And then the other mark was from 1891, which I've, really is so rare. Um, but here was Albin Dink, a, a Chinaware store in Vienna that started in 1702 and is still open um, was, you know, they had, they had Chinaware from everywhere. And so they, they basically, um, you know, wanted some stuff from Calden, England and commissioned this and it was sent there. So this is, this is a great teaching example. Like if you found only one piece of this shirt, you know, like a shirt of one mark, and that's close enough that it's not too bad. But in 1891 um, is when the McKinley Tariff Act passed and all products that were exported had to have the country of origin. So here we have England. That's not a hard and fast rule, but it pretty much is. So, so maybe they had made the body beforehand, um, but had to stamp it with this England mark. It's, it's, it's unknown, but I thought you'd be interested in that. Um, and my last slide is, uh, I love this Homer Laughlin mark. So it was used, Homer Laughlin, again, in the Ohio Valley, uh, founded by folks from England with artistic direction from England, became hugely popular as manufacturers of Fiesta wear, but they were really big in the semi-vitreous white-bodied earthenware market. And um, this blurred mark is common on US printed marks in this period. They couldn't quite get it correct. And it, from 1877 to about 1900. But what's so amazing about this is their statement, it's the American Eagle attacking the British lion. So there was you know, huge competition <laughs> between um, the, you know, the British empire and their ceramics and the American ceramic um, industry. So I thank you very much. And I'm sorry that I talked your ear off.
and um, it's late. So maybe we still have time for a few questions. I don't know. Yes, very. we'll try it. And actually there was a question in the chat already and I believe that Tom answered it. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm hoping that uh, that person is satisfied with Tom's answer. Um, if there are other questions that folks wanna put in the chat, um, please do so uh, at this time. Uh, while you are, while we're waiting on questions, I think I will go ahead and announce a couple things. Um, one is, as I said, we will, this is being recorded. Uh, the, we will be posting the video on the uh, Arizona Preservation Foundation website. Um, so I think they, it'll be on the website, probably link on their website. And they also have a YouTube channel. Uh, so I, I, I suspect we'll be posted there. Those of us in Arizona, if you're not in Arizona and want to join, we have a Facebook page called Arizona Archaeologists. Um, and a lot of the information from these series will be posted there. Um, we probably will also, once we get the link, uh, find other ways to get the link out. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is we're still working out those logistics. But I, if you're interested, for sure, keep an eye on it from the Arizona Preservation Foundation site, as well as the Arizona Archaeology Archaeologist Facebook page for those of you who are on Facebook. Um, so, uh, Let's see, I'm not seeing any questions just yet. I see we've lost a few folks, but I let me also add that, um, ah, here we go, we do have a question. It says here, you mentioned earlier that the webinar prevents the physical hands on part of, of seeing the material. Is there any way to work with, with the type collection? Terry. Well, um, some CRM firms in your region, I don't know if you work for one, um, they really should be building type collections for, for laboratory use. And, um, oh, Tom, your, your answer was fine. Um, but what I would say is, um, hmm, I wish you could come to one of our in-person things. It's really hard to know. I used to do a traveling roadshow with a colleague who has since passed away, but we would go all over the place and take our ceramics and, and glass and other things and, and spend days handling it. So I'm thinking of actually doing that in the future again, but I don't know, Tom and, and Margaret, do you have any ideas? Um, I don't, but I'm glad that, that this person brought that up because one of the things that Terry brought up, obviously this hour long presentation isn't enough. <laughs> So uh, we would love feedback from those of you who have attended. Uh, if you feel, you know, we thought about perhaps maybe offering a longer version of this or and some of the other talks, but a lot of it will come down to whether there's an interest. Um, so if any folks think that this is something that would be valuable to them and would be interested, uh, please, please let us know. All right, I'm seeing other questions. Let's see, um, I'll keep an eye out for in-person events. Uh, was there one about that that I missed? No, there's one below it. It says, I'm glad you went over transfer print versus decal. And, you know, the thing is, I really feel bad because it, I tried to cut back on things, but it's tough to do at that time. But um, that's a really important thing for historical archaeologists to understand. And without really seeing those, it's tough. You know, another thing that I used to tell students, <clears throat> go to flea markets, go to these big antique malls and just handle stuff and look at it, take pictures of it with your phone, you know, send me a picture if you have a question, but um, that's the way, the only way you can understand the stuff is really to handle it over and over again, and then it becomes second nature to you. Um, and again, remember that, you know, we're so used to seeing shirts as opposed to whole pieces that we don't, like, we can't fully envision the variability. So, um, but anyway, let's see, um, you know, and then let's see, Tom mentioned something and Mary Ellen did that we might be able to video an in-person event. Um, and um, yeah, that, you know, basically this site, this show was created for one purpose and I could create another show with a different purpose, you know what I'm saying? With different kinds of photography. And I see one that says, given the pandemic, it would be possible would it be possible to make a traveling trunk like a museum dues for schools to be accompanied by documentation in Zoom? That's certainly an interesting conception. Well, and I think we could do it because we have some collections in Arizona that don't 
have to be curated to the extent they're not federal collections. Like we had a huge amount of stuff from uh, leftover from a project we did in downtown Tucson and we could only curate, I can't remember exactly, but 200 boxes and there were probably another mm, 50 boxes. So many of them were using as teaching collections or um, I'm working with one of the, the local tribes because they would like it for their museum, for their use. So that's something we should remember, Hack, that this traveling trunk would be very cool. Absolutely. Okay, are there any other questions? Appreciate folks present, uh, offering up questions. And all your great suggestions too, right? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And so while you guys are thinking about it, let me remind you that we do have other, um, other let me see if I can put it up, other um, talks in the works. Um, let me see if I can share this. I'm not sure if I can. At any rate, I'll just tell you, uh, we sent out the poster and let me see. E -e 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 -e. I can't find it. So I'm not going to take a lot of time doing that. So I'll give you the dates. So those, hopefully you all saw the, the schedule. So the next talk we have is on February 17th on insulators and ammunition. We have a follow-up one on March 24th which will be tools, hardware, tech, and personal items. Um, in June, we'll be offering tours to a, a historic field school here in Arizona. Um, we will be sending out, we're, uh, there'll be two tours, they'll be limited in scope, but it's a good time to maybe plan to come see the Grand Canyon. Uh, we'll send out information about how to um, apply to, uh, to those tours. Um, and then uh, in July, uh, we will be offering up a, a course of our presentation on glass and bottles. And then August, we have can it will be offering one up on can um, can technology. Yes, Tom, it's in July. Um, so we are probably we are thinking about adding a few more discussed talks in the fall. A uh, couple of them include one on on um, mining. Uh, sites and industrial archaeology and, and possibly a, a second one to actually report out on the, the findings from the June field school at Apex. Um, so uh, we'll announce those as those get arranged, but for now we've got the schedule for August. Registration for each individual uh, talk will be done through the Arizona Preservation Foundation, so you'll have to register for each one. We'll probably we'll send out the registration link to register um, at least I'm, I'm working on it hopefully at least two weeks in advance. Um, we're working we'll be working on the poster for the insular ammunition one and we'll hopefully be getting that one out very quickly. Um, so if you guys have any questions or any other suggestions, we definitely want to hear them. I'm seeing we did see a few things in the deal. So Lynn says thanks for doing this. Uh, um, I see as someone uh, who has registered for the course, will we receive the flyer for upcoming presentations as they occur? We're posting everything on the Arizona Preservation Foundation um, uh, website. So what I would recommend is you, is you keep an eye on that. Um, we are not putting together a general email list because we, you know, this is for this presentation, we had 170 people who uh, registered from across the country. Um, so I would definitely keep an eye out there um, for those who, um, and we'll probably send it out on as many email lists and get it out as, as quickly as possible, but to be sure, keep an eye on the Arizona Preservation Foundation website. It will definitely be posted there as soon as the registration is available. Um, all of the coming sessions sound very interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm gonna see we'll have the registration for each monthly webinar. Yes, so each monthly webinar, each one will have its own separate registration. Um, yeah, and just keep an eye on that. Also the Arizona Archaeologist uh, Facebook page, for those of you who are on Facebook, it'll also get posted there for sure. Um, we did send it out for those of you who are with the Forest Service and agency, we did send it out through our internal agency 
And please, folks, when you get the information on registration or information about these um, up and coming talks, please feel free to pass the word out to anybody who's interested. Um, we absolutely um, would think it's great if folks want to go ahead and, and uh, help us advertise. Okay. Um, I, so I think. I think that's time. I need to shut it down. Yep, that is. All right, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Thanks, Mary Ellen, Mark, and Tom. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.